Perfect. So hello and welcome to the program on John Carpenter. Um, before we get started, we wanted to dedicate this to uh, two furry little angels that are over the Rainbow Bridge right now. Um, earlier this year, we lost our cat Watanuki, and then very recently, uh, this past weekend, we lost Hilo, which is why we did not originally present this on the or did not present this on the original date. Um, we were just in no real shape to present. Um, but uh, those two cats were great little buddies and uh, they were present for many screenings of many a John Carpenter film in our house. So um, this is dedicated to Hilo and Watanuki and we hope that over on the Rainbow Bridge, you're trading stories about watching the thing with us. <laughs> All right, with that. Thank you. All right, John Carpenter. So who is the man? Um, well, I would consider that he is in fact the man. He's a director, he's a writer, he's a musician. He produces films and I mean, based on his interviews and what he does now, he is just an overall cool old dude. He's always been a cool guy to me, but um, he's just, he's a neat guy. Um, if you remember my last November program on Scorsese, I would consider Scorsese a cool old dude as well. But there's something about John Carpenter where you feel like you could not only talk to him about film, that you would just want to hang out at his house for a while and uh, just shoot the proverbial ish as it were um you know as opposed to um as opposed to some of where horror is now where there's the whole trend of elevated horror with directors like um ari oster john carpenter's always been very a uh, taught i don't know if you would say would populist be a good word for him but i i'd always like he's an everyman horror director I, i'd say both are they're yeah. both good ways to put it i well, mean me, go on sorry I could almost say, part of me keeps circling the word, a phrase blue collar, but I feel like the, that's a little too simplistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the idea of every man and like definitely populist in his politics as we'll get to in films like They Live and the Escape series. Uh, but definitely he likes to have more of a, I guess like a loose feel um, as opposed to something that is very crafted and art directed like Ari Oster's Midsummer. His films feel a little bit less art directed and more lived in, but that is not to disparage his gifts as a director. He's an incredibly talented director. He knows how to get a great shot. And most importantly, he knows how to tell a great story. So how did John Carpenter get started? Um, he was born in New York, uh, Carthage, not New York City. And uh, he's actually never lived in New York City. He lived in Kentucky, um, when he was young, like from his, you know, the age of five up until his teen years, but for pretty much his entire adult life, he's lived in Los Angeles. Um, and we'll get to why that's a little bit funny in a few slides. Uh, but like a lot of these directors had an interest in film and storytelling from a very young age. Um, Martin Scorsese had going to the pictures and seeing the movies. Uh, John Carpenter had watching these films on television and he loved science fiction. He loved Western. And actually, I love this little tidbit from his bio on his website. And he said, oh, yeah, I consider Assault on Precinct 13 to just be a reimagining of Rio Bravo in an urban setting. And I am not a Western fan myself, but being a fan of film and knowing how malleable a lot of genres are and how you don't have to play by these very specific rules. I love that idea that he is like, yes, I consider this hardened crime drama in a city to be a retelling of a Western. Uh, and I think that's a beautiful way of how film and storytelling should work, that you shouldn't have to be bound by these very rigid sets of rules and very rigid um, definitions of the genre. So his dad, um, was head of the music department at uh, Western Kentucky University. And this also kind of plays into Carpenter. Um, number one, that's where he first attended college, which I mean, why wouldn't you? You can get a reduced tuition if your parent teaches there. And college didn't cost what it does now, but um, hey, you can't blame a person for saving money. But 
Carpenter also, in addition to being interested in film, is interested in music. He scores his own movies. So his, um, his dad being head of music was also his into that interest as well. So he first attends college at Western Kentucky University. He then transfers to the University of Southern California School of Cinema, going to major in film, but he actually leaves before graduating to make his first movie. However, he did make a few short films while in school. And Todd, do you want to talk about a few of those? So one I should be getting back to in a moment, but there is one of his early, there was one film he worked on early on. It's co-writer, producer, and this becomes a running thing because Carpenter famously joked half the reason he takes, he wears so many hats during his films is just because if he could afford to let other people do it, he would. But this is just, this is how he's always had to do it. But the really standout thing here, this is a little bar bet winner you could pull off. Carpenter has, has half credit on a short film called The Resurrection of Bronco Billy. This wound up, the year that they made this, this wound up winning the Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Film. So John Carpenter technically started his career as an Oscar winner. <laughs> I mean, that, that, so, I mean, that is a great thing to know. Um, for as much as I think Hollywood kind of uh, put Carpenter through the ringer, the fact that he started his career out getting that recognition is a nice um, is nice to know. And as we'll get to in the later years, like the fact that much of his career has been much more appreciated now than at the time. Um, I would love for one day Carpenter to get just like an honorary lifetime achievement award. Um, I don't know how I start petitioning the Academy, but I'm gonna figure out how. So the 70s is when he starts, you know, making full-length feature films um, after his short film. So his first film is Dark Star, which is a science fiction film, but also a comedy, which is, while a lot of his films have comedic elements, most of them are not out-and-out -out comedies. The only one that could even come close, I think, is Big Trouble in Little China. And that's an action comedy. Yeah, Todd, like thoughts? <laughs> Again, it's like, yeah, Dark Star is really the only other possible contender there. It's, he'll have bits of levy and humor in his other films, but very rarely does he ever go full to. The only other way I could maybe say he can make a case would be maybe Escape from LA. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think the action it's, comes first and foremost yeah. to that as well. Where is also, I mean, even for him, the humor in that movie is black. Yeah. Big Trouble in Little China is there's a silliness to it that we don't see in a lot of his films, but he has Dark Star, which puts him, gets him some attention, but in enough to get Assault on Precinct 13, which is what really, I don't want to say it really, do you think this would be the one that really puts him on the map? It, Assault I on Precinct, so. yeah, it got attention. Yeah. The one other thing which I do need to give Dark Star a shout out for here, besides Stanley being his first feature film, it is also technically like the prototype for what would become Ridley Scott's Alien because Carpenter's big collaborator on the movie was Dan O'Bannon who would go on to work on that movie and one of the subplots they worked in when they were expanding from a short film to a feature did kind of plant the seed for what would later become that movie. Mm -hmm. Then he has Halloween in 1978 and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. He also um, directs a TV movie called Someone's Watching Me. And then the other TV movie he has is Elvis, which marks the beginning of his collaboration with Kurt Russell. And at this time, for um, reference on Kurt Russell, for some context, Kurt Russell was a Disney kid. And he was looking to break out of the Disney kid mold. This is something we see in a lot of child stars. We saw it back then, we still see it now. The quest to want to be taken seriously. You don't just want to be the kid from the computer wore tennis shoes. Um, and thankfully, Kurt Russell found in John Carpenter a great collaborator and someone who was willing to let him not just play the lead, but let him play a character like Elvis and let him play a grizzled hero like Snake Plissken, a loner like R.J. McCready, and a doofus like Jack Burton. Um, I mean, I think more, I, Kurt Russell is the actor that's gone back, that's worked with John the most, correct? Oh, easily. Like, he's yeah. got a couple recurring, like, supporting people, but, but Lee. His, his work with Kurt Russell is celebrated yeah. for a good reason. And also, um, Carpenter wrote a few scripts at the time, most notably The Lies of, um, Eyes of Laura Mars, but he's starting to really get his foot, um, pl 
planted in Hollywood as one to watch. And no movie really established him as one to watch in a director that, you know, demanded to have his work seen than Halloween. Um, still one of the most successful technically independent films of all time. And his most successful film to date, um, and not just because he still gets royalty check after royalty check for all the sequels and the remakes and the more sequels and whatever's going on with that franchise. Um, and there's such a simplicity about the original Halloween. Teenagers are stuck babysitting on Halloween, a mental patient escapes, and he's returning home to the scene of his initial crime. It's such a simple thing, and John Carpenter manages to just create a masterful suspense film. It's not the original slasher, um, because Black Christmas predated this by four years, I believe. Yeah. But in terms of where the slasher would go, Halloween set the standard. And I, in, it is like almost like Night of the Living Dead in that you can't imagine the horror landscape without it at this point. So Halloween is not even in my top five John Carpenter films. I like it, but I would never say Halloween is overrated because I, I understand the contribution it has made to the genre and to film history as a whole. Um, actually, John Carpenter, he had a, uh, John had a great quote about Night of the Living Dead, another great independent film where he said, any independent movie has a little bit of George Romero's Night of the Living Dead in it. Uh, but yeah, let's look at, let's look at this budget. At the time, keep in mind, this is 1977 when they're filming, $325,000. And he'll say himself, this was work for hire. And if you look at, he's doing the score, he's doing, um, he wrote and produced it with Deborah Hill, who, Deborah Hill, someone who's finally getting credit as um, an important person in horror, because again, had Deborah Hill, the producer, not looked at John Carpenter and said, this is the guy, we're collaborating together, we may not have even had Halloween, or Halloween would not have existed as it does now. Um, it was a breakdown, breakout for actress Jamie Lee Curtis. Obviously, um, she's currently in Halloween Ends right now, reprising her role as Laurie Strode. But more importantly, Michael Myers became one of the most recognizable villains, monsters in horror in modern horror history. Um, you know, he's still lumbering around in that blue suit and that white William Shatner mask, which, yes, it was a William Shatner mask that they just spray painted white. Um, they needed something that looked blank. And I don't know what it says about William Shatner that a William Shatner mask <laughs> looked blank. Um, fun other fun fact about this, this movie was supposed to be an anthology series. He envisioned it as each movie would be a different type of movie. So we see that with Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. It's a completely different story. It just happens to take place on Halloween. Unfortunately, in 1982, the audiences were not receptive to Halloween 3 season of The Witch, and we got more and more and more and more Michael Myers to uh, really waning levels of success. Um, Carpenter's not super attached to this series, I have always gathered. He's proud of it. He's proud of the work he did. He's proud of the impact it has, but there's films, especially ones in the 80s, that I think he is far more attached to. Um, but Todd, what's that great thing he said about the Halloween franchise um, and the effect it has on it? He's always had, so he, per that attachment, he's always had a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a self-deprecating, but in a good nature way about some of his work. And Halloween, he's always kind of famously joked about with the idea of like, he'll, he'll say, I just think it's so great. Every few years I'll look and I'll see a headline about another Halloween movie coming out. And sure enough, just like that, another check falls into my hand. Like, hey, man, it's, it's not his baby the way as much some of his others are, but he kind of looks like it pays the bills. Okay, which... Although, I oh, do need to give one other shout out that did not come up on the slide. This kind of marks, it's not as, it's not as big as some of his other co uh, creative collaborations, but this marked the beginning of his work with Dean Cundy, who is, he, he contributes to a lot of what becomes Carpenter's visual style in the 80s. All right. And speaking of which, we are going on to John Carpenter in the 1980s. Now, I look at this list and I see a great track record. I can't think of many other directors who have had that good of a decade. 
I mean, Scorsese in the 80s had a great track. Actually, you could argue Scorsese up and up to um, from Raging Pole to Casino is a win. But man, talk about that for a great decade. Classic after classic. Um, pretty much all, with the exception of Prince of Darkness, are a big part of the film canon, definitely a part of horror and science fiction canon. Even, um, Prince of Darkness has even kind of been starting to get yeah, more it's getting it's crazy. getting a comeback. Um, of these films, Prince of Darkness is the weakest, but even then, it's a gr- it's a really good movie. It there there's not a bad film in the bunch, which especially for the 1980s and the nonsense that John got put through is a miracle. So we start out with the fog, which is um, with all the talk about should we really be more truthful and not have the rose tinted lenses around Thanksgiving. And maybe we shouldn't have Columbus Day anymore because it's essentially celebrating a myth. The Fog is a film that's become more and more relevant. Todd, would you like to explain why? So first off, I will say, I know we're in November now, but if you're looking for a good atmospheric ghost story in October, this is a solid hit to go off of. The entire story contain it involved this little west coast town called antonio bay and they're they're coming up on one of their big anniversary celebrations the local priest winds up finding out kind of in concurrence with these strange occurrences that are going on the town's history was basically built on this incident i won't go into too much detail for spoiler reasons but basically as he puts it we're celebrating murderers the town did this horrible thing in their past they covered it up and now the ghosts of those that they murdered are coming back for revenge Again, t- kind of timely and relating to the larger conversation about, ooh, should we really go into some of the uh, less savory aspects of our history? Also, great Hal Holbrook performance. Um, the great Tom Atkins is in it. Jamie Lee Curtis comes back again. Um, I think the last time she really worked with Carpenter, although she returned to the Halloween franchise. Uh, didn't she come back for the voiceover work? In, in, no, she did the voiceover in Escape from New York, and I think she would come back for LA on that one. Oh, you're right. You're right. I thought that was Adrian Barbo, but thank you. No, that was the thing. Yeah. Um, Escape from New York, a great movie. Fun fact, this was my parents' first date movie. Which, man, had I known that when I was a teenager, I would have had, like, way more respect for them at the time. I would have been like, all right, at least he used to be cool. Uh, But this is the story of New York um, is essentially what every Midwesterner thinks New York is right now, which is just a crime ridden island, which I'm like, it's really not, you know, Uh, but it's been cordoned off. The president's plane crashes and it's up to Snake Plissken, played by Kurt Russell, to go save him. Uh, Great movie. uh, And it's a good play on... Uh, If you like the Warriors, you'll like Escape from New York. But one of the things I like about it was, while it is this futuristic version of New York City, um, and again, as I joke, it's like, it's what your Midwestern aunt who's never been to a big city thinks New York City is like. You also get the sense of the, you know, hey, the president, the world outside of New York isn't that great either. And there's almost a reason why New York is the way it is right now. And we also see that repeated in the sequel, Escape from LA. Uh, But Escape from New York is a ton of fun. We have The Thing that comes out in 1982, which we will discuss in the next slide. Um, But The Thing was actually the truly pivotal movie for John in the 80s. Because The Thing comes out and does not do well. Uh, The Thing came out um, two weeks after E.T. the Extraterrestrial, and if you knew what the box office was like in 1982, you know that E.T. steamrolled everything. So John ended up actually losing a few gigs, most notably directing um, the adaptation of Firestarter. However, he was able to get Christine, a Stephen Stephen King adaptation. Wait, Todd, did I have a... It is a Stephen King adaptation, Oh, they both are, yeah. Okay, I, for whatever reason, my brain just went, no, it's not. But yes, a Stephen King adaptation. And that is a modest success. It does well enough to buy him some more goodwill. Then he has Starman, which gets Jeff Bridges an Oscar nomination. A sci-fi movie getting an acting Oscar nomination, something that is almost unheard of now. Um, yeah, the Oscars used to be a lot more open to genres. Um, you know, what changed? Well, the voting pool changed. Then we get Big Trouble in Little China, which is an action comedy, which is a love letter to those old kung fu movies. 
Unfortunately, that doesn't do well, but he has Prince of Darkness and then he closes it out with They Live, which They Live might be the movie he defends the most. Um, not because it hasn't been appreciated. Um, it's definitely appreciated a lot more now than it was when it came out, but because it is um, constantly used by bad people to prove a point. So if you've not seen They Live, it is, again, if we're going back to John Carpenter being a populist filmmaker, it is, and these are his words, a takedown of the Reagan era. Um, the main character is played by Roddy Roddy Piper. He's a drifter who just to make ends meet and keep a roof, you know, keep himself fed, um, works construction day jobs. Um, he has to live at a homeless encampment, which at one point we see bulldozed, um, again, timely. And then he, he finds these classes and realizes people are, there's just subliminal messages telling people to just consume, obey, marry and reproduce make money um basically uh, and uh we then find out that we're you know being controlled by these aliens from outer space and that there are humans collaborating with them because they're like well it's not going to work out well for most of us but i'll be okay uh so yes a very big takedown of the greed and the it's all about me of the 80s however it is used it's been used very recently by um, anti-Semites for, you know, if you know anything about anti-Semitic conspiracies, you can tell how they're using this. So John Carpenter has pretty much at any point he sees it being used as a way to spread hate. He has been like, no, it's not. Get your, get your hands off my movie. I think if, of all of his films, that would be the ones he'd be, he'd be most upset if it was remade. I could see him just being like, don't you touch it. This movie's perfect. Um, also, They Live has a great six minute fight scene between Rowdy Roddy Piper and Keith David, which you can find on YouTube. Um, it's great in the context of the movie. It is hysterical out of context. Uh, put on the glasses, everybody. But the standout of the 1980s, one of my favorite films of all time. I don't think we can talk about John Carpenter in the 80s and John Carpenter in general without talking about his adaptation of The Thing which is, is based on a cinema's... short story called Who Goes There. Is this cinema's greatest comeback story? It may very well be. So as I mentioned earlier, when The Thing was initially released in June of 82, it came out two weeks after E.T. and just got bulldozed. Along with uh, another film that's really well regarded now, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Just two films that when they initially came out, they were ignored and Critics didn't like the thing either. They considered it too gross. They considered it too violent. Um, I love Roger Ebert, but his review was, um, he, he didn't hate it, but he was just like, it, he just dismissed it as a gross out film. And I do wonder if that was one of the films he went back to and was like, oh, I, uh, I was wrong on it, but I, I'm not sure because Ebert, was never big on horror. He gave it a fairer shake than Gene Siskel did, but that was always a genre he was a little um, out of touch on. But what is the thing about, it's a 12 man research team in Antarctica and they encounter a shape-shifting alien who initially arrives in the form of a dog. Uh, Kevin, we talked about dogs earlier. What would you do if you saw two Norwegian guys shooting at a dog and you couldn't understand what they were saying? You would assume they went crazy from isolation. And that is what the guys in this research team do. They take the, um, they uh, take the dog in. They assume, you know, they assume the, the, the Norwegians, or as they're called by a number of people, the crazy Swedes, went crazy. And then, um, you know, it all starts to go haywire. Most notably, when they put the uh, thing dog in the pen with real dogs, and the real dogs immediately realize, uh, hey, that's not a dog. That's, that's not a dog. And uh, I will just say, if you've never seen this movie, the scene where they're in the dog pen, if you are a dog lover is upsetting and you might want to turn away. Um, but it is a great film, great effects work by Rob Bottin. Um, in even beyond all the blood and the viscera and the gore, what's truly scary about this film is the feeling of isolation and the feeling of paranoia. And these people, you may not be their friends, but you've been living with them for a while but now you don't know if you can trust them. There's a great line 
where someone says, I've known Bennings for 10 years. We've worked together for years. How can you tell me that wasn't him? And another character replies, you saw it yourself. That was not him. And I think that is where the fear, the true horror of the thing lies is, and it's similar to Invasion of the Body Snatchers, this I've known this person. What if they're not who they say they are anymore? Or what if they're just a little bit different? Um, great film. Uh, I, I mean, I could talk, Todd, we could talk about this all night. Would you like to take, uh, to take a few words to talk about this movie? Well, first of all, I got to say, I was just so surprised. I, I thought for sure your st- or snatch quote for this was going to be, nobody trusts anybody and we're all very tired, considering <laughs> well, we're almost that's kind of to- become the iconic line from the film. We're almost at winter, Todd. <laughs> also fair. Yeah, this because was... If you want I- to de- describe that scene a little bit more. So, yeah, again, there is, for as much as the reputation is for the violence and gore, that. It actually comes in bursts. There are there are a lot of lulls in between where it is just it's everyone kind of essentially sinking into distrust and paranoia because they don't know what this thing is. They don't really know the rules of how it works. Keith David at one point kind of actually says comes out perfectly when he asks one of the other guys, "If I was an imitation, a perfect imitation, how would you be able to tell?" Exactly. So there's a scene where. You see McCready alone. Once again, Kurt Russell coming back and knocking it out of the park. And he's basically making a recording of what's happening. And he says, nobody trusts each other anymore. And we're all very tired. And then the he- The line got a lot of play in 2020. It, it did. It got a lot of play in 2020. <laughs> nobody trusts each other anymore. We're all tired. But he then rewinds and then just says, RJ McCready, Outpost 31 signing out. And we never know why. I mean, number one, we never know if anyone found this recording, but we also never know why he didn't want anyone to hear that part. Actually, that's one of the other things I've kind of come to appreciate more on the rewatches is this movie deliberately sets up certain puzzles it never solves. And that just, it ups that feeling of like, you're not sure and you're kind of second guessing what's going on at points. Yeah, and I think with modern films, the fact that everything's a puzzle box and everything needs to be answered modern audiences are not okay with ambiguity as much anymore. And that's one of the things I love about The Thing is we don't know, you know, who got to the blood supply and what, and yeah, there's a, there's blood supply with uh, blood types for people in case there's a medical emergency and they've been sabotaged. We never know who did that. Uh, We never know exactly why Keith David left his post for a bit. We also don't know who, what happens at the end. Are they both infected? Are uh, there's two survivors at the end? Are they both infected or neither infected? Do they survive? Probably not. But um, the, amb- the the unanswered questions work for this movie, and it it's the fact that they're unanswered doesn't make it lazy. It adds to the mystery. And so earlier, um, just to bring it all back to what Todd said, um, one of the greatest comeback stories ever. That is John Carpenter's The Thing. It, it um, as I said in the previous slide, this ended up losing. John lost jobs because this movie ever performed. Um, But in the long run, this film has been redeemed because while it didn't do well in theaters, on VHS, it found a new life. And it is now regarded not just as one of Carpenter's best movies, as one of the best horror films of all time, and a great argument as to why, yes, sometimes remakes can work, remakes can be good. And I'll bring this up as a great remake, but it also, you know, it's an example of if you're going to remake it, make it your own. Don't just try to do a shot by shot remake of the original movie. Um, if you have not seen John Carpenter's The Thing, I would say give it a shot, even if you are not a horror fan, because it's a masterpiece. Um, and if I had the money, I would order uh, I would order some of Rob Bottin's models from this and just keep them in my home. Pretty sure Guillermo del Toro has one of the things from this movie. <laughs> I was about to say, I would be stunned if he didn't. Yeah, he that that man, if you've ever seen the inside of Guillermo del Toro's house, he's like, I have I have all this memorabilia. And I'm like, oh, I love him. Man after my own heart. So we go to the 1990s. Um, well, John had a stellar decade in terms of output. It wasn't a stellar in terms of getting good work. So after 1988's They Live, 
he does have another movie for uh, four years, and his first film back is Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Todd, you're going to talk about that in a bit. We'll leave it there, but yeah some fairly unremarkable output he has a tv movie called body bags which is good but it's like oh it's not the john we love in the mouth of madness which is good is great i'd say great actually it's yeah it's kind of like his last really knocks it out of the park movie uh, so again it, it's another it kind of became a comeback story but we'll, we'll get that's there. true um in the mouth um in the mouth of madness comes out in 94 we he, speaking of remakes Village of the Damned remake in 1995. And I think he was just higher. This was a work for hire movie for him because all of the work he put into being like, all right, I am going to remake thing from another world, but I'm going to do it differently. Not so in Village of the Damned, right down to the kids still having platinum blonde white hair. Uh, there's some good things about this movie. Christopher Reeve is in it and Christopher Reeve, I don't think he can give a bad performance. Um, I actually think the lead girl play the the little girl playing the lead creepy kid is actually quite good. Um, none of the ki- none of the creepy kids are too precocious. I think they're they do a good job. There is a great death in that movie. Um, the janitor. So, you know, yeah. The uh, so they're basically the whole town blacks out at a barbecue and then they all wake up. But um, one poor man was over oh, an actual grill. And when they wake up, someone looks over and screams and you're like, oh, well, yeah, that's what would happen if you blacked out over a grill. Um, hey, it's a horror movie. You go for the death sometimes. But overall, really not a remarkable film. Um, then we have a little burst of old John back again with Escape from L.A., um, a film that was not, it was kind of a divisive when it came out. You, Roger Ebert actually liked this one. He's like, it's playful. It's got a good satirical bent. It's a lot of fun. You do have a lot of John Carpenter's politics in it as well, where he's just like this corrupt theocratic government is just going to keep, you know, doing stuff for itself. Uh, you know, not on Snake Plissken's watch. Um, but it, it's a lot of fun. It's very silly. John Carpenter actually thinks it's better than the first, which I'm not sure I agree with, but watching it, you can tell John and Kurt were having a great time making this. Um, and yeah, like, again, hey, um, just to show that Roger Ebert does give people a fair shake. He, again, he did like it. He gave it three out of four stars. Like, this is a lot of fun. Uh, what can I say? Although, um, not everyone liked uh, Escape from L.A. So, granted, this also goes to a larger issue of one of the more... So... There's a critic who for years kind of, he kind of didn't really have this rep as recognized. People are probably starting to come around to the fact that more Owen Gleiberman for Entertainment Weekly is kind of, he's been really running that professional contrarian bit for a while now. And one infamous quote actually came in his review for Escape from LA where he, he declared, Carpenter was never the filmmaker as Cal claimed him to be. And this is actually him kind of trying to be charitable to Escape from LA, but that's still a really... And granted, he only he only gave that a C plus, but it's still a you're really gonna die on this hill, buddy, are you? Yeah. Oh, John Carpenter, not a great filmmaker. Yeah, whatever. Um, I mean, that's why you write for Entertainment Weekly, my dude. <laughs> and I then, mean, the most he can say is at least he's not Armand White, but that's that's damning with faint praise. Who's the worst contrarian critic? Is as of right now, is it Armand White, Owen Gleiberman, or is it Richard Brody? Brody seems kind of determined to take the crown. <sighs> At first, he gives a bad review to everything, everywhere, all at once, and then he says Tar is a dangerous film. I'm like, that, that man, I'm going to have words with him one day. Um, and then we close out the decade with Vampires, which, uh, yeah, not great. I, I, In some ways, I would like to believe that Escape from L.A. is John Carpenter's final movie. It just feels right, kind of like how I like to just believe that The Departed is Jack Nicholson's final performance. But... I promised we'd talk a little bit more about In the Mouth of Madness, especially for Todd, because you're the one that actually introduced me to this movie. So, like I said, this was another that was kind of a comeback story for him. I honestly had not heard of this movie for the first few years it came out. I only learned about it later when a friend of mine in high school was like, they had a copy of it, they loaned me the tape. 
I then proceeded to take gross advantage of our high school's PR department to make a copy of that VHS. Finally, she got a legitimate copy on DVD. And for years, this was like, if this came up on lists, it was more like this was, uh, this was just, it would come up on general HP Lovecraft inspired film lists where it was always taking a backseat to, again, generally good films like Reanimator, but it was always more seen as like, it was a secondary mention. It's only been in like the past five to 10 years, people have started to look at this and go, this is actually a really good movie. Well, and it's also partially because we've seen the rise of stuff like conspiracy theories taking hold of people in very real ways. Well, I mean, great. this is becoming big before that, but yeah, that definitely has helped. This so in the broadest of broad strokes, this is yeah, as it says, like Samuel plays an insurance investigator who is sent to try and track down this very influential horror writer. They've clearly modeled him off of Stephen King, but I'm going to be honest, Jurgen Prock now looks like Neil Gaiman in the movie to the point where it's distracting at times. <laughs> and basically, the, the whole thing winds up being, they talk about his books have this really unusual effect on their readers. Like, they cause them to kind of start to disassociate, lose track of reality. And this whole thing kind of gets kicked off by the, by the fact that Samuel's character gets attacked by the, the author's agent, who is now essentially an axe-wielding maniac in that moment. And he basically, it turns out, this is all by design. He is, he's basically using his work to drive people collectively insane. And yeah, it's, again, it's very heavily steeped in Lovecraft style concepts. And we didn't mention it here, but it's actually, this is part of a three-part cycle of what John Carpenter called his Apocalypse Trilogy. It started off with a thing, it went on to Prince of Darkness, and this is the third part where each movie is, it's literally the stakes are the destruction of the entire human race. And each movie, he kind of to use the to use the doomsday clock analogy, each movie in the series he kind of ratchets it closer to midnight until this movie quite literally ends with the the extinction of all humanity. With Sam Neill laughing in a theater. Yeah, he is basically the last human, and it is a it's a genuinely haunting final final scene. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I I almost thought about putting Escape from LA on here, but I think this is just it edges it out as just being a stronger movie. And it's also, this is John Carpenter doing horror, which, well, he's, he is considered a master of horror. John has never considered himself to just be limited to one genre. But when John, when John decides to do horror, he is fantastic at it. So now from the standout of the 1990s, we're gonna go to this. And uh, Todd, you decided to watch this. I, you know what? I thought I've been through enough this year. I'm not doing it, but so, you're the so Here's the, th so I know we say, and kind of, again, the idea of not every Carpenter film does well on its initial release. I'm not saying that because this is good. This is still generally considered the nadir of the man's work, but I'm just putting this in context. Several of the films in the 80s, which are considered beloved now, were not that well received when they first came out. Things like The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, they were kind of considered, they kind of tanked at the box office and it really limited what kind of work you could get for a while there. And this was, there was, you actually dig into it more, there were a lot of projects that he could have been in the running for that either he wasn't interested in or they fell through. Fun fact, at one point, he was actually considered as a director for Top Gun. He, he chose to bow out on that one himself. He did not, he was not feeling that one. Well, I mean, considering how much involvement the United States military government had, I could see John really bristling at that. Well, then he, he looked at the ending and I was like, this movie is basically, you'd be kicking off World War III. That's stupid. I'm not doing <laughs> this. <laughs> oh, I love that, man. But yeah, for a while there, he was hard up. It's like, it meant for a while that he was trying to find, he was trying to find work. Because yeah, after the 80s, it was getting he was basically in, in a contract for a while there with a live pictures, which this was kind of part of. And I'm going to be perfectly honest. This was definitely a work for hire. Cause this movie, if there is any one person who is responsible for this movie, and I use responsible here as both brought it to life and is why it is a train wreck. It's Chevy chase. Yeah. Like this was a passion project for him in every sense of the word. He wanted to make this movie as a chance to kind of, flex himself as an actor he he bought the rights to a book that wasn't even finished being that wasn't even finished or published yet just because he wanted to do this and oh boy oh boy so to further vindicate john on this will acclaimed screenwriter william golden was attached to this project for a while there and in his own words 
and this isn't one of his memoirs. He just uh, he described this movie as this was a train. Uh, so to answer your question, a work for hire in this case, this wasn't the project he was pursuing. This was they needed somebody to direct this. They were like, could you pick up the co- could you this is a you do this one for the studios type of thing and maybe we'll pay it back later. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was say just to interject and add on to that, because I think um, a lot of people just have this um, the vision of Hollywood where all actors make Brad Pitt money and all directors have like the pull of Steven Spielberg. And for the most part, that is not the case. Most actors, even well-known actors, will take jobs they don't really want just so they're like, I can get a paycheck and stow that away. And the same goes for directors and even writers. Just, I mean, there's a reason that one for the studios, one for me is something that is bandied about in Hollywood. Cause they're like, well, I don't really want this job but this will give me the money and the clout to get, do something I really want. And yeah, this, again, William Goldman, he openly called this movie a train wreck and tried to get out of working on it pretty famously so. Yeah, and this is the one movie you say that John Carpenter will not discuss. I've heard there's always he's not too crazy about it, but yeah, this is the one where it's like flat out he does not like talking about this. And it's understandable because he get number one, again, this was a contract gig for him, and he really in part of this was I know we discussed it before, was the idea of Carpenter saying, I do some of these parts of the job because if I could afford to have somebody else do them, I would. And there were points in this where in order to get more money from the studio, he had to concede more and more control. And subsequently, that control went to Chevy, who was basically, again, this was his baby. This was his big, this was his big ambition. Yeah. And if, and if oh, sorry. I don't, if you've never heard, of that, heard this before, about it before, although I'd be surprised, Chevy Chase has a reputation for being difficult, is I think the most polite way to put it. Sorry. He is a very, he's a very ego-driven man with, eh, with his very high opinion of himself. And he made Carpenter's life making this a living hell. Apparently, Carpenter also got some flack back from Daryl Hannah, but I digress on that one. The rest of the cast, apparently, were, he worked got along okay with. I mean, he worked with Sam Neill again, but between those two in the studio, Carpenter just got really burned making this movie. And it's not even like we can look and go, at least the finished product is worth it. It doesn't feel like his work at all. It's got some nice visual effects and a good supporting cast, but they are not enough to save this one. Yeah, it, Chevy Chase is always one of the most frustrating examples for me. Like, it's, when I say the presence of Chevy Chase, I don't mean to say that Chevy Chase is not funny. I think Chevy Chase is hilarious. And when you get a good director and a good script with him or someone who can wrangle him, you will get magic. But... Well, I mean, that's also part of the problem here. He's not trying to be funny in this one. Yeah, and the other thing is, you know, Chevy Chase is just difficult and there's a reason he just does not work anymore and for as much as we will talk about people will say other things get them blackballed in hollywood nothing will get you blackballed quicker and more permanently than just being a pain in the tookest to work with and And unfortunately john had to cross paths with chevy (laughs) yeah actually that was so Parsi, in lead up to this, I was listening to the podcast Blank Check, where they kind of went through John Carpenter's filmography, and they kind of discussed going to this, he kind of, part of the reason he took this was for the opportunity to finally be able to work with, like, a big A-list star, and who oh, he picked the wrong card for that. Oh, no! Yeah, and so, yeah, this this took a uh, Carpenter's career, which is already kind of on Rocky Road before that, this was a massive pothole. It did not, it kind of set Daryl Hannah back, as a, back in her career, and this this is the final nail in the coffin for Chevy Chase's leading man. This because the film year before that, he had nothing but trouble, which was another very well-known bomb. Yeah, this film was basically a career killer. Not quite permanent career kill, but it, at the very least, hobbled several big names. Hmm. And unlike, you know, unlike movies like Waterworld, it's just, it's barely discussed, which is kind of, which is interesting. You'd think a movie that hobbled that many people would be in like the hall of fame of bombs, but not so. Like the one thing it has going for it besides supporting cast is there's some good visual effects, but yeah, just watch like a YouTube highlight reel of those. You don't need to, you don't need to spend the 90 minutes. Oh, so moving on to the aughts and it's kind of sad on account of, it's John's film career going out with a whimper with Ghosts of Mars, which is 
not a good film. And again, there's a reason I like to think of Escape from LA as his true final film. Um, Ghost of Mars is so bad that Ice Cube, who was the lead of that movie, when he was interviewed, I think a year or two later for a barbershop or something, um, they're like, what's the worst movie you've ever been involved with? And he goes like, Ghosts of Mars. And that hurt me because John Carpenter is my dog. I love him. And I was so excited to work with him. And even he cut John Carpenter slack saying like the studio wasn't good. And, you know, but it was, it's, it's really, it's as bad as you've heard. Um, he did eventually make another film called The Ward, which is better than some of his previous output, but really just not up to the standard of what he could do in the 80s. He did, however, have some success in television. Uh, he did two episodes for the Masters of Horror show, um, uh, an anthology series. He finally got there. Um, he directed Pro-Life, which was, which was actually written by uh, 80s All Over co-host Drew McQueenie. So Drew McQueenie got to fulfill a lifelong goal of working with John Carpenter. And then Cigarette Burns. Um, I, did, I hadn't seen Cigarette Burns. I did see Pro-Life and it is really good. I mean, you've got you got Ron Perlman in there. You're, you're going to have a good time when you've Ron Perlman. Um, and he seems to be far more passionate directing these two episodes of television than he did in something like Vampires and Ghost of Mars or Village of the Damned. Well, I mean, it kind of goes to what's become the running consensus. We more so in the 2010s, but starting to film the odds of the idea that you get more freedom on television than they do in a, in a movie studio. Yeah, and as the fil as films, as Hollywood has been going more and more towards global box office, global film market, someone like John Carpenter, who even in his prime was a little bit of a niche uh, director. I mean, yeah, I can't, I really can't think of how he'd work into today's film landscape. Um, I mean, there's barely an independent film landscape at this point so i don't know where he fits um but he did at least continue to see the money rolling in because there were more halloween movies and the fog and halloween uh the fog got remade the halloween was remade by rob zombie which is an atrocious movie the remake of the fog is forgettable the remake of halloween not the one that came out in 2018 but the one that came out in 2007 is awful one of the worst movies I've ever seen, which BT dubs subtle plug for next month. <laughs> but what's John doing now? Because while his film career kind of petered out, John is going strong. And if any, like he's become more of a beloved figure now than when he was at the height of his filmmaking powers. Um, his films like The Thing, They Live, Escape from New York, um, they've all achieved cult status. Um, stuff like a uh, big trouble in little china been reevaluated and they're all now kind of seen as like man what were we thinking ignoring these back then so he's been kind of he's lived to see his own cinematic redemption um and he i almost get the sense that he's having more fun not making movies because again i think he sees where hollywood is going right now where it's for the most part cash in on existing ips and nostalgia and I think he's very happy to not take part in that. But what he is doing right now is he's making music. Um, John Carpenter, for the most part, scored all of his own films. Um, the one big exception being he did not score The Thing. That's a, that's a score by Ennio Morricone, which is also fantastic. Um, and in 2015, he released his first non-soundtrack album called Lost Themes. And he has been continuing to make his own music. He gives concerts. He also works with his son, Cody, um, doing music as well. Uh, those the 2018 Halloween he did compose the scores to that so he has stayed working but I think for him the more behind the scenes work that isn't directorial is where he's happiest um, he's also been partnering with people like Shout Factory for uh, this Godzilla marathon that happened earlier this month I mean they kind he's of already had him on speed dial since they pretty much released they got like the almost the exclusive rights to releasing all of his films at this point oh yeah and they shot factory did a great job releasing all of his films too with the remasters getting all the extras getting interviews with them they took good care of his stuff um so i mean he's not just fading away into obscurity he is still very active in hollywood in the music and film scene he's just not directing but sort um very similar to don bluth a few months ago where it's a i'm still doing what i love I'm just waiting for the rest of the world to catch up. 
Yeah. Um, although I, 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 I think John Carpenter could get a chance to direct another movie before hand-drawn animation comes back. Sorry, Don. Well, again, I think Drew McQueenie put it best. If anybody's going to get him back in the saddle, it's Kurt Russell. Oh, man. If, if You know what? Snake Plissken can go back for a third, can he? Um, but yeah, no, I, I like to see him direct again, but he also seems, I mean, he's kind of talked about in interviews where he thinks Hollywood's going and I think he's just like, he, I think he feels he's glad he got to make the movies he did and he's glad that he got the freedom he had because you know what, you're not going to get freedom working at Disney, but oh, yeah. yeah. If he wants to host a Godzilla marathon or make his own music, he gets all the freedom he wants. And that's what a lot of the old school directors really strive for. Even if they're doing a work for hire, they still at least want their own autonomy while they're making their stuff. And with that, we are going to go to questions. Oh, yeah. What does work for hire mean? Um, yeah, that's... Uh... He answered that, so that's good. Thank you. Well, um... a lot of, I mean most like great even the great directors they got their start doing you know work for hire like scorsese got to start working with roger corman um actually roger corman who we should todd we really should eventually do a program on that man oh roger man that, corman, that might have to be a two-parter for his legacy alone yeah. but roger corman who's best in, i mean i was introduced to roger corman um the uh mystery science theater 2000 so these very cheesy films he made um and i don't know if he's a particularly talented director but the man knew how to make a movie on a budget and he also knew how to spot talent so uh people like jonathan demi jack nicholson he's like oh you're good he basically midwifed uh, the hollywood of the 70s yeah he's in the 90s there yeah he um he's He's a guy who I don't know if I'd call him a talented guy, but he's got an eye for talent. <laughs> it, 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 but, I, find it, I find it amazing. I mean, I didn't realize he had some prodigious output during the 80s and 90s. I mean, he did basically almost a movie every year. Yeah, 80s yeah. especially. Uh, oh, yeah. And again, the track record of that is really yeah astounding because, again, there's not really a weak movie in the bunch. Um, and they're, with I think one exception, all beloved movies now um especially i mean at this point if you were to go on film twitter i mean who knows how long twitter will last at this point <laughs> that's and, a topic uh, for another day <laughs> yeah, really. but say you know i don't really think john carpenter's the thing is that great everyone's just going to be like you know why are you just being so loudly wrong As a, that just basically in a way i'm sure carpenter appreciate that would just turn to the western cliche of every gun in the bar comes out yep <laughs> <laughs> I, I never knew that about Chevy Chase. I, I, he's funny in certain things, but uh, oh yeah, to find that uh, he's really such a jerk is uh, it's not surprising I mean, it's, when you really think yeah, about not it. Not surprising, yeah. It's kind of funny and sad to realize his last really big role was on the show Community, where Dan Harmon basically cast him as himself. And even Chevy Chase eventually got himself fired from that job. <laughs> There's another. Here's another program you could do, though, guys like him, people like him in Hollywood who were, you know, or did maybe you did one like that in a different way. Uh, we, that's what I've been bandying about, because with the um, actually, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, thank you for coming, everybody. Yeah. Uh, stop recording. Oh. Uh. Dang it.